All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Florida Museum 360 virtual experience. Today, we're going to take you back in time to explore Florida's fossil record at the Florida Museum. And to do so, we have with us a very special guest, Dr. Bruce McFadden. He will be joined by our youth outreach coordinator at the museum, Alberto. Today's event is brought to you by the Florida Museum of Natural History and UF Thompson Earth Systems Institute's Scientist in Every Florida School program. Because there's so much for us to see today, I'm going to actually turn things over to the team at this time so we can start the adventure. Alberto. All right, everyone. So let me take over your guys' screen. And now you should be magically transported into the museum. So anyways, hi everyone, my name is Alberto Lopez and I will be navigating us through the tour. So buckle up and get ready to experience the giants of Florida's prehistoric past. So during the tour, there will be many opportunities for you to engage with us. So please use the chat box to answer any questions we ask you and be sure to type in any questions that you might have and they, we will be able to answer them at the end. So when we think about giant prehistoric animals, probably the first thing that comes to mind are dinosaurs. Now, if you've done our previous 360 tours in the fossil hall, you already know that there were no dinosaurs in Florida's past, but we did have animals that were at least 30% larger than any of their living relatives and these animals are collective, collectively referred to as megafauna. And that word megafauna, basically mega means big and fauna means animals, all right? So before we begin the tour with Dr. Bruce McFadden, I actually have a question for you all and I want you to participate. So this animal that you have uh, right in front of you, this giant, does it remind you of an animal that lives today? So write your answers in the chat, no worries. No, don't worry about spelling. Just go ahead and write those answers in the chat and Brian will read out those answers. Hey Alberto, I'm seeing a lot of elephants, elephant. More and more elephants come in, seems to be a general consensus. All right, that's good. How did our uh, audience do Bruce? Thanks Alberto. Well, the audience uh, got off to a great start. Definitely, this is the mammoth, and the mammoth is related to the modern elephant. The mammoth also, the mammoth that we have in the skeleton here is of the Colombian mammoth, and it's related to the perhaps better known woolly mammoth known from colder regions of the Northern Hemisphere. Oh, okay, so is that why uh, they have fur and the Colombian mammoth doesn't have it then? That's correct, the woolly mammoth has more fur uh, living in the northern and colder areas of the northern hemisphere and the Colombian mammoth lived in more temperate and even into some of the tropical areas and therefore it, it didn't have the, the, the massive fur that a, a woolly mammoth did. Interesting. Yeah, so let me let me follow up and just explain this, uh, this skeleton to you here. This Colombian mammoth uh, stood about 12 to 15 feet tall as a uh, paleontologist estimated it probably weighed around 10 tons. This particular beautiful skeleton articulated in the, the, the central gallery of our museum was collected by Florida paleontologists decades ago from, what's, from the Oscilla River. And we know based on radiocarbon dating that this particular individual lived about 16,000 years ago. The entire skeleton is the real deal but the, the, the tusks and the front part of the skull were so heavy that we actually replaced them with fiberglass replicas, which are much lighter weight. So the skeleton, so to speak, wouldn't topple over under its, its weight in the front. But we have the uh, original uh, tusks and upper, upper jaws in our collections. Mammoths became extinct, not just in Florida, but elsewhere, elsewhere in North America about 10,000 years ago. Awesome. So let's move to our next giant, the mastodon, which also is related to the mammoths. But let's look at these teeth that we have right here in this panel before we move on, um, because they apparently have very different teeth. Why is that? Yeah, thanks for stopping here, because this graphic display panel uh, really tells the story of the two different kinds of teeth that we see in the mammoth on the left and the mastodon on the right. 
we've just seen the mammoth skeleton, but in just a few, in a minute or so, we're gonna go over to the mastodon. They lived in the same ecosystems, but they divided up their food resources. They were both plant eaters, uh, so as to minimize competition for, for plant foods. The mammoth has uh, gr has a grinding surface. The mammoth is on the left-hand side. Can you move your, very good, thanks. It had grinding plates that would be well, well adapted for feeding on uh, a tough abrasive grasses. On the other hand, to the right is the mastodon and it had more bulbous with what are called cusps, rougher surfaces that could be used to, gr to grind or to, yeah, to, to mince up um, soft leafy vegetation. So the, the mastodon is called a browser on the right, eating soft leafy, leafy vegetation. The mammoth on the left is definitely a, was definitely a giant grazer. All right, so let's walk over and take a closer look at that mastodon that we've been talking about. So bear with me as we virtually walk in the museum here. All right, and let's take a closer look and let's talk a little bit more about those physical differences between um, the mammoth and the mastodon. All right, so what differences are there between the mastodon and the mammoth? Yeah, the, the mammoth is was taller and perhaps more elegant in its posture and composure, whereas the the, the mastodon is is was it was also a megafauna, but it was it was sort of stubbier and stouter in its overall conformation, so to speak. This particular skeleton was was collected from near the mammoth in Florida, from the Osceola River. It too also consists mostly of real bones. As I just mentioned, it lived in the same ecosystem as the mammoth during the end of the last glacial in in the ice age at about. 16,000 years ago. And as I said, they're, uh, based on our teeth, we know that they divided up the plants, the available plant resources, so that the mastodon was a browser and the mammoth was the grazer. This, is sh this, this particular skeleton, and indeed ma the American mastodon as well, is typically shorter, it's not as tall as the mammoth. I said the mammoth was anywhere from 12 to 15 feet long. The, the mastodon was probably eight to 10 feet tall. And it likely weighed about half the uh, that of the mammoth. It was probably around weighed about, about five tons. Whereas the mammoth is a very close relative of the modern elephant, the mastodon, on the other hand, is more more of a distant cousin relative to the to the mammoth. Like like the mammoth, the mastodon also became extinct throughout all of North America about ten thousand years ago. Wow! Awesome. All right, so let's walk over to one of our more uh, other popular giants that we have in the museum. And if you've ever been here before, I could probably bet that you maybe even taken a picture here because this is just such an impressive uh, exhibit that we have here. Um, so Megalodon is known as the largest, most fearsome predators in the ocean. So. How do scientists know how big this animal was? Yeah, well, we don't have the complete body fossil, uh, the body of the megalodon um, uh, fossilized. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes as we walk through the fossil hall. But the megalodon, which is the large jaw on the right, thank you for, for zooming in on that. We can basically tell that the size of that animal, what that, that animal was based on the size of its teeth. And we also use, use modern analogs like the great white shark. We know that a great white shark with a particular size tooth has a particular body length. So we use that analogy to say that if we know, if we can measure the height of a, of a megalodon tooth, sometimes they get as long as high as seven inches, then we can also estimate the length of the body. As a good rule of thumb, for every inch of height of a megalodon tooth, that represents about 10 feet of length. So a giant megalodon tooth that's about seven inches tall probably belonged to an individual that was about 70 feet long and could have weighed perhaps upwards of 25 tons. This particular jaw is a composite of individual teeth that were collected from the St. John's River in Florida. They're not from the same individual. They were teeth uh, recovered from the bottom of the St. John's River, put back together into this beautiful reconstruction by Dr. Cliff Jeremiah, who donated this jaw and other jaws in this display case to our museum for, for exhibit purposes. And he reconstructed the jaws 
and fit the teeth into the jaws and the jaws are actually fiberglass. Uh, let's see, Megalodon actually means giant tooth and obviously a tooth that's seven inches long from a fearsome predator like this would, would uh, connote a name of Megalodon. And Megalodon is related to the modern, modern Mako and great white sharks of today. Very cool. So every time I go to a museum, I always uh, see these jaws of sharks displayed, but why don't we ever see their skeletons? Well, to answer that, let's go into the fossil hall and take a walk through time. All right, so let's do that. Bear with me as we move into the fossil hall. It's this beautiful animation. All right. So here we go again, walking. We're now walking through the Eocene Sea from 50 million to 40 million years ago with the kinds of animals that used to live. Uh, and we have uh, reconstructions of their fossils. And there, let's stop right there, Alberto, and zoom in on the, uh, there you go, that shark, that shark sculpture. So the reason that when you go to museums, Alberto, and you see the fossilized shark jaw reconstructions with the giant teeth and the jaws themselves, but nothing else, is because sharks, unlike ourselves, the skeleton of sharks are is not, the skeleton is not composed of hard bones like the bones in our body. The skeleton of sharks is composed of softer connect a softer tissue called cartilage, and therefore cartilage does not normally fossilize. And what we have remaining of the fossil sharks that we we use in the fossil record to understand the ancient history of these animals or their size is their teeth. And so this sculpture made of metal was specifically um, uh, intentioned for us to be able to show the visitor what the scale of that animal's body was like using that, that entire sculpture. Uh, let's see, this particular individual was the ancestor of Megalodon and it lived in the world's oceans about 25 million years ago. It was half the size of the modern Megalodon. It was probably around 25 feet long. And um, it, it really, it, it was the beginning of a major group of what are called megatooth sharks that lived, uh, that lived throughout the world, but then became extinct by about 2 million years ago. Wow, so actually, so I have a question and this question is for all of you uh, watching is, so what do you all think happened to Megalodon and its ancestors. Of course, I think Bruce might have a, have a good idea, but I am actually curious, what do, you, what do you all think? What happened to Megalodon and its ancestors? So go ahead and write those answers in the chat and Brian will read some of those out loud. Alberto, I see some of our uh, attendees are still thinking, still writing, but so far we have things like an asteroid, starvation, maybe they died from a meteor, uh, maybe their food has become extinct, another asteroid still extinct from ran out of food. Bruce, are any of those right? Well, some of them, some of them definitely are on the right track. Uh, food resources, climate change, not so much an asteroid necessarily. The asteroids are more associated with what, with, uh, what provided the death knell for, for the dinosaurs about 65 million years ago. But in terms of these megalodon and their ancestors, the megalodon became extinct about 2 million years ago. And this was a time of, of rapid climate change in the oceans, which, which may have caused change in the food sources and maybe even a drop in diversity of the prey that megalodon would have fed upon the giant whales. But another thing that scientists now understand is that um, before about 2 million years ago, another major predator evolved in the oceans and that was great white shark. And it was definitely living both alongside Megalodon and likely com com competed for the same re food resource, that is to say whales. So some scientists speculated, speculate that uh, Megalodon was outcompeted by um, uh, more modern species of, of large sharks like the great white shark. All right, so now 
let's come back on land to see what was living on H in Florida. And as I move along, Bruce, so that basically means there is confirmation here. Megalodon is extinct, not like, you know, it's meant to be believed by popular movies on Hollywood, right? Megalodon, definitely extinct then. Correct. So regardless of what, what is said on TV, on, <laughs> on movies or shows that relate to sharks, um, the, uh, the producers of those shows or directors of shows would like to say that maybe Megalodon is still uh, still swimming around because just the thought of that uh, conjured up in our mind as humans is hard is scary to comprehend. But so far as we know from the paleontological and fossil record, Megalodon came became fully extinct. It no longer exists. It became fully extinct about two million years ago. All right, that's good to know. So now we're actually going to talk about this animal over here, but. You know, one thing that this virtual space does allow is that we could actually walk over this barrier. So let's just take a little closer look right here. Okay, and I'm actually going to ask you all. So does this animal remind you of any other animal that is still living today? This one right here. Okay, so write those answers in the chat. Does this giant remind you of any living animal? Alberto, so far we're seeing flamingo. We have ostrich. Uh, another group are similarly agreeing. Ostrich, flamingo. We have chicken. Bruce, what do you think of those responses? Yeah, so ostrich is good. It's a ostrich is a large flightless bird. Ostrich, emu, animals that live, species that live today. But this actually, this skeleton is really cool. It's a uh, a replica a sculpture of an animal that lived in Florida about 2 million years ago, and it's called Titanus, the terror bird. It was a giant flightless bird, and it actually is extinct. It has no direct modern descendants. Its closest relative is actually an animal, a species called Siriyama from South America. And Alberto, if you could zoom in on the panel and show, um, show the viewers, there we go. That's, the, that's what a modern, relative of the extinct Titanus looks like today. Let's go back to the skeleton, please. All right. Yeah, so the skeleton uh, is an artist's reconstruction based on fragments of the terror bird fossils that were found in the bottom along the Santa Fe River, north of Gainesville. The, the Titanus, the terror bird lived in Florida until about 2 million years ago. And it, it stands about seven feet tall and probably weighed several, several hundred pounds. It migrated from, the, from South America into North America after about 5 million years ago. It walked across the, Pan the Isthmus of Panama or what scientists call the, great, the Panama Land Bridge during the Great American Biotic Interchange. It for sure, look at its beak. Its beak and it, the construction of its skull indicate, look at that huge hook on the front of its beak. It reminds you of a raptor bird of today. That animal was a fierce and dominant apex predator at the top of the ecosystem, ancient terrestrial ecosystems on land in Florida until it became extinct about two, so far as we know, about two million years ago. That's impressive. So let's move on to another equally as impressive uh, giant that also originated in South America and migrated to North America about 2 million years ago. So let's move over. Let's go right around, I'd say right around here. I think this is a good view right here. Okay. So what is this giant creature, Bruce? Yeah, so uh, it's, it's tall, it's giant, it's robust. Uh, some people call it the dinosaur in our museum, but it's not a dinosaur. Dinosaurs did not uh, exist in Florida um, because Florida was underwater for the entire time of the age of dinosaurs. So this is not a dinosaur. This is actually a, sloth, a giant ground sloth that used to live in Florida about 2 million years ago. It was collected from a lime rock quarry uh, near Newberry. It stood about 18 or 20 feet high, as you can see. It probably weighed, oh, around three tons. 
It lived in Florida, this giant ground sloth, or all giant ground sloths that came into Florida because there were multiple invasions of ground sloths from South America. They lived in Florida from about 2 million years ago until about 10,000 years ago. And like the terror bird, these giant ground sloths migrated or walked northward across the Isthmus of Panama during the Great American Biotic Interchange. Interestingly, um, one, of our, one, of our, one of our viewers asks, what did it eat? And actually that's really in an interesting question, which I was just gonna talk about because if you can see, if you can look in the graphic panel, Alberto and show the giant claw, there you go. That claw right there is from one of these giant, giant ground sloths. And when paleontologists like Thomas Jefferson, our president, who also was an amateur paleontologist, when he saw this, this claw, he, claw, he called it megalonyx, which means gigantic claw. And he thought that this particular animal, this particular species may have been a carnivore, a flesh eater. But if you look at the teeth of that animal, the teeth are very different. They're not the kind of teeth that would be, uh, you can't, it's, it's hard to see because the, the jaw is upright, but basically the teeth of the, of the giant ground sloth are adapted for feeding on plants. They're, they were herbivores. And the claws were probably not used for predation, but they were used for defense against predators, but also, also grasping leaves of trees to bring the, the leaves, of, much like a, um, a giraffe of today would grasp a, a, a branch of a, a high branch and then bring it down to feed on it. Those claws were probably using, used for, for feeding. The, the ancient or extinct ground sloths are related today to modern two-toe tree sloths, much smaller in size, that are found in tropical or neotropical forests in Central and South America. Very cool. So actually, I have another question for all of you watching. So why do you think all these animals, why did they get so big? Any guesses out there? I'd like to hear. So write your answers in the chat and let's see how we all do and Bruce will, will tell us. So why did these animals get so big? Bruce, so far we're seeing a lot of what they ate. They had yeah. so much food. Again, yeah. they had a lot of food. Maybe it had something to do with the temperature or back to their diet, or maybe yeah, there was so more air, which allowed them to grow more. More forests. I'm seeing a lot of really good answers. Uh, getting bigger uh, is an advantage if you're feeding on plant foods and you need more time to digest those foods in your stomach. The larger you are, the more time, it's called residence time, the more time you the plants uh, spend, the plant foods are spending while you're digesting, uh, digesting them in your stomach. So yes, larger size confers an advantage to a herbivore, a plant eater, who's feeding on, on foods that need, that take a long time to digest. The other thing about uh, getting larger in size is it provides more protection against potential predators. Imagine an animal trying to, imagine a predator trying to go after that giant ground sloth. With those, uh, with those large claws. It would have been more difficult to take down that giant ground sloth the larger it got. So um, to answer your question about why did things get larger, we see this frequently in the fossil record and typically it might be related to the kinds of foods they ate or better protecting themselves or other kinds of factors related to, for example, for climate change, for thermal insulation and uh, less heat loss if, a, if the animal's body gets larger. So it's not a simple answer. It's a combination of different factors that all interplayed to understand why animals in the past, like the megafauna, got big. All right, so let's now talk about why these land megafauna beca became extinct. And to do that, we're going to stop right here, okay? Why is this an important stop to learn about this, Bruce? Yeah, this is a really important uh, site to talk about the, the contact between the native megafauna that was living in Florida about 12,000 years ago and a new species arriving on the scene, humans. And we have direct evidence in the fossil record of humans that hunted the megafauna. And in fact, this is an ancient 
This is an Ice Age buffalo skull or bison, excuse me, bison skull. It's more properly referred to as a bison. And your cursor is just right there. Right there, that's actually a spear point that was embedded in the skull of that, of that bison by an early human that was hunting, presumably hunting that, uh, that, that bison, that megafauna for food. We also know that based on scrapes on bones that the, the humans were, uh, were also hunting large elephants like the megafauna like mammoths, which are depicted in, in the, the mural in the background. So we have direct evidence in Florida of uh, human hunting until the megafauna became extinct in Florida about 10,000 years ago. That's so cool. So are there any other active sites where scientists are looking for more giant spruce? Yeah, if we have a few minutes, let's end up with our, with our current fossil site called the Montbrook locality in Levy County. And this is a site you can see here, what it's like to collect fossils in the field, how they come out of the field in plaster jackets. And we have large sacks of, of sediment that have tiny fossils in them, like you can see in the lower right-hand corner. But right in the middle is, is an, an, a, a more distant elephant um, relative called a gomphothere. And gomphotheres are related to mastodons and very distantly related to modern elephants and mammoths. And the gomphotheres themselves uh, weighed several tons and also stood fairly tall. Uh, and they were an example of the, of the beginnings of the megafauna in Florida about five to six million years ago, which is the age of this Montbrook fossil site. And as I said, we're currently working and digging at, at this site actively. And you can see some of the people who've dug at this site back in the photographs there. And then you can, uh, you can see uh, various fossils that we're collecting here. That's so cool, actually being able to see that up close, that's amazing. So before we leave the fossil hall, is there anything else you'd like to add as we wrap up, Bruce? The first thing I'd like to say is that if you are interested in helping us collect fossils, um, there is a way that you can sign up to volunteer for collecting, helping us collect fossils at the Montbrook uh, uh, site. And Stephanie has put that, that address in the, the website where you can sign up to be a volunteer at the Montbrook fossil site. Um, that's up on the chat. I wanna sort of wrap up what we've seen. We've been talking about from the, the mammoth to the mastodon to the megalodon to the, to the ancient megalodon ancestor, to the titanus, to the giant ground sloth, and then to the, to the hunting of megafauna during the end of the last ice age, the common theme of this 360 walkthrough today has been ancient, gi ancient giants of Florida's past. And what I wanna say is that getting large or becoming a, a giant is not always an advantage. All, all of the animals that we've, we've stopped and, and discussed so far on our walk through time are no longer with us today. Likewise, many of the Earth's animals are in danger of extinction today. And those that are in, in, in small population sizes and large body, bodied animals are particularly prone to extinction today. Biologists fear that we're losing tens of thousands of species per, per year as a result of climate change and human activity, and that this biological crisis rivals the worst mass extinction that paleontologists see in the past. So sort of the final comment is that our Florida's prehistoric giants tour allows us to better understand our past and therefore hopefully provide lessons for, for our future. Thank you. That was great, Bruce. Thank you so much. Now, don't leave anyone because now we're actually going to move over to our Q&A session and I'll let Brian take over. Excellent. Thank you so much, Bruce. Thank you, Alberto. Uh, as Alberto said, if you have any questions for Dr. McFadden, please write them in the chat box and we'll make sure um, those questions get answered. Um, so, oh, great. Our first one is already in. We see that volunteers must be a minimum of 18 years old for Montbrook. Do you have any opportunities for students? We don't yet. You do have to, uh, you, uh, you can't be a minor and dig at the site uh, for, for various reasons. And um, so 
uh, hurry up and become 18 and then you can come and dig with us. And it'd be good if you can bring your family as well. But basically we have to restrict for safety and security reasons, um, the digging to, uh, to individuals who are no longer minors. Though, Bruce, the, the, if they want to look for fossils in other places, they certainly can, right? Absolutely. absolutely. If you want to collect fossils um, closer to home, uh, you certainly can. It's just that we are restricted by the regulations and policies of the university uh, that we must only uh, have um, uh, uh, folks who are old, 18 years or older to help us dig at the site. Bruce, our next question comes in from Mary Hess, who asks, what was the coolest find you've dug up? Wow. So I've been digging up fossils for almost 50 years. And about 45 years ago, when I was a graduate student, I went to Pakistan to collect fossils with my major, with my professor and a research team of paleontologists and anthropologists. And I collected an almost complete skeleton of a of a uh, new species of ancient primate of a monkey-like fossil. And its skull and all its teeth were just spectacularly preserved. And probably in my entire career, that's the most spectacular um, fossil that I've ever collected. That's really incredible. Thank you for sharing that with us. Our next question is, what is the best part of your job? Well, so I'm blessed to have a wonderful job that allows me a lot of different things that I can do, a lot of independence to think up and then uh, implement uh, projects that I'm interested in. I would say I really like understanding um, the ancient world. I'm particularly interested in fossil horses and what they teach us about the theory of evolution. So I would say the best part of my, my job is actually um, asking questions and as a scientist, researching or investigating those questions to find answers. I also like teaching, love teaching, advising graduate students. I love, I love going out in the field and collecting fossils. So there are many dis different aspects of my job. And for me to just say there's one that's the, uh, the most fun, it, a lot of it's fun. I love that. I love hearing how passionate you are about the work that you do. So moving on to our next question, uh, we have an attendee who's curious, do you have any dodo bird fossils? We do not. We do not have dodo bird fossils in our collections at the museum. So at the museum, what is our specialty? What, what do we have the most of in our collections? Wow. So we have 40 million specimens and artifacts in our museum. And if you haven't visited our exhibits museum on the campus at the University of Florida, I invite you to do so. It's a it's really a spectacular museum. Our museum ranks in the top five nationally as one of the best and largest natural history museums, particularly at universities. We have about a dozen different collections spanning uh, the various types of paleontology. We have a herbarium that has uh, preserved specimens of modern plants. We have fish, amphibians, reptile and mammal collections. And then we have the largest butterfly and moth collection in the entire world in our McGuire Lepidoptery Center. So we have lots of different question, uh, collections. And the cool thing about our exhibits is a lot of our collections are on display. So when you come to the museum, you can see sort of the best examples of what we have to offer in the, behind the scenes for, uh, from our collections that number now more than 40 million specimens and artifacts. And I absolutely encourage everybody to stop by when you get a chance. It's an incredible experience to be here. Uh, Dr. McFadden, our next question is actually from a fifth grader. The uh, fifth grader asks, is it exciting to be a paleontologist? And are you in a lab a lot or are you in the field? Yeah, so it's definitely exciting to be a paleontologist. The thrill of discovery, uh, you can't beat it. So you, got, you go out looking for fossils and then you collect a uh, a new species of monkey. I was, uh, I, you know, I was, that was when I was a student, it was, it was a thrill, but uh, I'm thrilled to collect fossils. I remember when I was in Peru about 15 years ago, I found a giant megalodon tooth and, you know, I, I've, I've known about megalodon for decades, but the thought of the thrill of actually finding your own megalodon tooth that would then went into the collections um, is something that really is very special. So I would say um, I spend some time in the field um, I spend some time in, geo, in a chemistry laboratory studying the chemistry of fossil teeth. And then I spend a lot of time looking at fossils in our research collections. 
So it's not just I primarily spend time in the lab. I don't wear a white coat and do chemical experiments like most people view uh, what a scientist does. I do uh, very uh, different things. And moving on, our next question is from Ariana, who's a fourth grade student. She's curious, has anyone ever tried to steal the fossils? Um, if they have, they've been unsuccessful. To my knowledge, no one's tried to steal our fossils, thank goodness. We have security guards that look after our fossils in the exhibits and then behind the scenes in our research collections, they're under lock and key. So our once the fossils have been have been brought into the museum, we say that they've been accessioned, then they're 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 uh, carefully taken care of, uh, and and we protect not just the fossils from disintegrating, but also from them uh, being being um, uh, stolen, and that's not happened. And as well in the public too, right? There are specific yeah. areas where you can find fossils, and you can't take them out of that where you found them. Sure. Now, if you're on a state park or a national park, you can't collect fossils. If you're on private land in Florida, you can collect fossils and you can get a permit to collect fossils on state state property like like rivers and other water courses. There are places that you can collect fossils and there are places that you can't collect fossils like on where on areas, uh, particularly state and and federal lands and national parks that protect those fossils. Our next question that just came in is, what is the newest fossil collected? What are paleontologists that you have currently finding? What are they looking for? Things like that. Yeah, so at Montbrook, we're looking at um, ancient ancient alligators and their relatives that, that, that lived in Florida. And also, just last week, we had some teachers uh, digging at the Montbrook fossil site. And one of the teachers uh, collected a fossil gonfathir, uh elephant-like animal from that site. So that was one of the most recent finds that we've had. The tallest fossil that I've ever found was probably the part of a giant, um, a giant ground sloth, like you saw in our walk through the, the fossil hole. All right. Well, Dr. McFadden, thank you so much. I believe that's all the questions we have for today. At this point, I'm going to turn things over to Stephanie to start to wrap up. Thank you, Brian, for that. And a very special thank you for everyone joining us today. A special thank you to our scientist, Bruce McFadden and Alberto, our guide. We hope you've enjoyed our time together. You can learn more about the Florida Museum of Natural History and Scientists in Every Florida School by visiting the websites you see here on your screen, as well as in the chat box. Um, on both sides, you'll find additional opportunities to engage with us. And again, thank you very much from both Scientists in Every Florida School and the Florida Museum. Have a great day and goodbye.